Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is H. Melt. I am the poetry coordinator at Women and Children First Bookstore. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which Women and Children First sits is the occupied territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, and Miami people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois. We encourage you to research whose land you're on in your own homes and communities. Women and Children First is currently open to the public for in-store shopping with masks required and limited capacity. We are also processing online orders every day, have curbside pickup and ship across the country. We are primarily focusing on virtual events for the foreseeable future. Um, this fall, however, we have a small number of outdoor book signings with Chicago authors like Ana Castillo, who will join us tomorrow afternoon to sign copies of her new poetry collection, My Book of the Dead. Tonight, I'm excited to celebrate Dear Diaspora, um, which won the 2020 Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry and just came out with University of Nebraska Press this month. Um, I'm so excited to hear from Susan Nguyen this, this evening um, and joining her, we are going to have two incredible poets, uh, Jenny Chi and Roy Guzman. Um, there is a green button at the middle and bottom of your screen, which says buy the book. Um, if you purchase the books through Women and Children First, you will also get a signed book plate. Um, so please, please, whether it is Women and Children First or your own local independent bookstore, please get a copy of the book. Um, I am going to encourage you to leave comments in the chat. We all know virtual events um, can be especially nerve wracking for um, readers and it's always great and encouraging to see feedback and to see comments. Um, so please feel free to do that. And also to use the ask a question box um, after our conversation this evening. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to our first reader, Roy. Thanks everyone. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I am Roy Guzman and I am very, very, very excited to be uh, celebrating Susan's uh, debut collection. Uh, and to be reading here with Jenny. Um, and I really wanna thank Women and Children First for hosting this event. Um, it's a beautiful space uh, that I've been to in, it, you know, back when I lived in Chicago. So um, if you can support this bookstore, support other uh, independent bookstores, uh, that's just, you know, the kind of token that we need um, right now in this pandemic. So, I was thinking about uh, Susan's book and this question, of course, of not just diaspora, but beginnings. And um, something I've been trying to do is, uh, especially this year, is to try new things, uh, things I've never done before. And so today I was actually, I'm actually very lucky to start renting a cello. Um, I've never played uh, cello, never played, um, I played a little bit of guitar when I was in high school uh, and some piano, but um, mostly vocal. So I'm really excited to start this chapter. And so in thinking about beginnings, um, these are the three poems I'm gonna read for you tonight. The first one is part of a series called Queerodactyl. Queerodactyl. We vold in graveyards, headstones big as daddy's factory plant, Playboy magazines littered under the bathroom sink, sour cream drip drops on our mustaches. No one knew whose mom had charred the tortillas. We scraped marmoleum floors with our heels. Geometry went defunct 
went apparel, berserk, bull in jeans, torero. Our mothers near their lips to our dirty claws as we sway them in men's holy, unshaven catastrophes. Prayers so lit, you think they went out to find a job. We no longer search for food on the ground or in the sky. New border by its shame, plunge our bodies into it. The way a father's hand might twist, tighten, rip a rosary. Have we ever told you what else we felt when the earth's doors betrayed authority? When wind unfurled wig and crystal beads, the sacraments in our hands. Had mercy shown up as mercy, we might have stopped the idealized throttle, picked our hips from the humid ground, fashioned ourselves a new savior. So there are several poems um, in the collection that follow this sort of theme of the queer dacto. Uh, and this is a very strange, um, these are very strange creatures um, that populate the book. Um, but they're very, I don't know, they're, they're, they're interesting creatures to me. Thinking about sort of the, the theme of the, the, um, the fantastic, I love cartoons very much. I love video games. And um, I don't know if any, you know, I'm, I'm hoping some of you are familiar with Arthur, the animated uh, TV show. So this is uh, a poem that's inspired by one of the episodes. It's called Arthur Spelling Trouble. And a lot of the names you'll hear are names of characters in the, in the show. Jenna is asked to spell essential. She trips before Arthur is challenged with artvark. He freaks out. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Arthur rolls his arms, swings in his blue jeans and yellow cotton sweater, sings out each mellifluous letter as if memory held the body accountable for demonstrating the ritual of remembrance. He gets it right. With only a year of ESL, I win my school's spelling bee. I spell platypus correctly, though I can't conceive of a platypus. I know plate, I know pus. My mother works three jobs to pay for my tuition because the people we clean houses for claim it's better than getting beat up in public school. I come home with a bloody nose nearly every day. The school's denomination is Lutheran, so we memorize Luther's small catechism, forever confessing sins in hush purgatory. It's private like the school I went to in Tegucigalpa. You can't get a decent education otherwise. And my mother reminds me where to mark accents on Spanish words like crossing off memories I'm losing from lack of access. Just imagine a clock, she says, and the altar behind me vibrates. When I am assigned the word platypus, picturing it in my head as if I were cutting around it with a crude pair of scissors. I'm not expected to win. To everyone's knowledge, I don't speak sufficient English. Arthur advances to the finals, but he doesn't want to represent his class at the school-wide spellathon. Mr. Ratburn thinks I can do it. He share he shares with his family over a simple dinner. If only all brown children had similar mentors. I begin gorging a new words, hood nomenclatures. I learned their roots, but never my own. 
I spell platypus, and even the pastor's wife can't trust her ears. Afterward, the certificate bears my name in sloppy ink over marker. Maybe she was starting to write down someone else's surname when I was declared champion. Or maybe she wanted her son, who's in my grade, to make a comeback and win the title. He's blonde, and I have a crush on him because I can see all the veins through his pale body. He excels in every subject. That's what's expected of him. I received the same grades, but that's not expected of me. Literature is a subject that persistently keeps me off the honor roll. So I keep looking up words from Romeo and Juliet in the dictionary, but my dictionary isn't smart enough. Inadvertently, I'm looking up contractions, abridgments, contraction, C-O-N-T-R-A-C-T-I-O-N, contraction, as in establishing a contract with anything that dwindles, as in new disease, as in unplanned childbirth of words, platypus, from flat-footed. The schoolmate who called me fag behind my back enrolled in the Marines around the same time I signed up. We train as a unit. I look over my shoulder, paranoid that given the opportunity, he would out me. He was flat-footed, was never deployed. Faggot. F A. G G O T faggot. The majority of us recruits were the first to land in Iraq and Afghanistan, primarily poor sons of refugees, to die abroad as if dying on US soil wasn't already effortless. They're not looking for brown mines, but brown war machines, my stepfather says. The beauty of machines is that they can be disassembled and reassembled. DW says, I'm not a prisoner of my vocabulary, but I can spell anything that prays for my destruction. A palindrome is a word that has two chances to disappoint you. There came a point when I was so pedantic and territorial with words, I couldn't finish full sentences, spilled words in my sleep and balm my thoughts. I watch Arthur when I'm sick to my past lover's chagrin. Cartoons are too infantile, they say, like parents who dab, who dab hot sauce under children's fingers to discourage them from thumb sucking. They can't see which episodes, though, I've hid my luggage in kept my dug ear thesaurus, my musty diplomas like diplomats to intercede for me when I'm, my accent is called out as if my tongue held lesions unconscious to me. What dictionary are you using? The brain says after he misspells the word fear. Fear as a part of speech, synonyms. They're transgressions that can only be found in mirrors. Can you use it in a sentence? I was applying eyeshadow when my cousin stumbled into the bedroom my mother and I slept in. I must have left an after image in the mirror smeared with a thick, a, br a, br a, br a brown boy's thick eyelashes, a shade of blue to enrapture other brown boys as I turn around to stare into her eyes, ankles shaking in my mother's pumps, hands behind me as if handcuffed. I slipped a cosmetic through the narrow gap of a drawer, half the heels trapped under the chiffonier, a broken TV screen, in the episode, Arthur in his round brown glasses, polytonal specter, sings letters to a war that one day might define him. My parents are not home yet. I rub they vapor, vapor up on my temples. I'm back at the Lord's table, mispronouncing the wild dream that finds me in the language that I might speak, from which I might drink. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And please, please support Susan's uh, debut collection.
Wow, Roy, that was one of my favorite poems from your collection and I loved hearing it out loud. Um, so thank you. And thank you everyone. Um, thank you to Women and Children's First. Thank you H Melt. Um, and it is such an honor and pleasure to be here with Roy and Susan to celebrate Susan's book, Dear Diaspora. Um, Susan and I actually met at Tin House Winter Workshop last year, and I will just always remember that now as one of the last bright spots uh, in the before times. Um, and at one point we ate delicious fried seafood together and like watched sea lions frolic, and it was really delightful. <laughs> um, and I, I really love what Roy said about beginnings, and that is sort of a theme in uh, the poems that I'm going to be reading today as well. And something else I thought of as I read Dear Diaspora um, was home and what does home mean and what does that look like? Um, so I'm gonna read a few poems from my forthcoming collection, Focal Point. And the first um, is early on, and this is Letters to My Mother. For 100 days after she died, I wrote her a letter each day, as I had once called her on the phone. I burnt messages on colored paper with glowing orange tips of incense, rough to the touch like used sandpaper. I blew sandalwood ashes to the wind with choking, wet, ragged breaths, gasping as she had. In my daily letters, I told her about my two roommates, awards I won at semester's end, the book from a favorite professor. I told her I would fold her cranes from colored paper, a thousand as dictated by some foreign myth. I told others I might string them up and hang them as mobiles in my room. I told her about the smoke alarm I set off, burning paper cranes with sandalwood incense and candles. I told others it was the oven in which I had forgotten my burnt toast. I told her the smoke smelled like her, fragrant soaps and musky carved fans and creamy white gardenia blossoms. I never believed in anything. Now I believe in everything, all the rituals of all the faiths. If I turn off the lights, stare at the soft incense glow until my vision blurs, I can imagine myself born back to her in ashes of paper wings. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is in honor of Susan's current desert home. I grew up in the desert, not in Phoenix, in Las Vegas. Um, and every time Susan posts an Instagram with cacti in the background, I feel a bit of nostalgia for that. What we grew in the desert. My mother wanted flowers, fragrant and lovely. So she flooded young seeds until they boiled in midday heat. And when they didn't bloom, she thought she could will blossoms with sullen silence. My father wanted fruit trees, hardy and useful. So he baked saplings in the sun until they brittled into sand. And when they didn't ripen, he thought he could shout them into submission. At night, I snuck into the garden and sang my pleas into the leaves. Still, the gardenia blackened and scorched. The jasmine shot its stars into the ground. The peaches puckered around unformed pits. In the end, all we grew was oleander. Pink flesh burst from clay, blowing sweet poison to the wind. Uh, 
Um, these days, I live in San Francisco and I've been here almost a decade. And the next poem I'm going to read, um, I wrote sort of dealing with that transition. Transplant. Friday night in San Francisco, the fog, a cold wall boxing me in, insular contempt driving me out. Get out of our city, go back to where you came from. Techie scum, chink. Never mind that chinks like me built the city, dusted its hills and creaky trains with their bones, painted bridges with their blood. Sunday morning, I am sitting in a free patch of sun in the park, watching the first dogs arrive, sniff new tales with suspicion. I don't need you to remind me I'm not from around here. A transplant that won't take, like the first foreign hearts rejected by the body before scientists learned how to make them beat as if they always belonged. Um, and I will close with one last poem that is very much about beginnings. It says, Postcards from the Living. I light incense on the stove top trail cinders through an empty house. I've decided to believe in the power of ashes. Here I am, buying fruit, mending torn shirts, brushing teeth in cramped bathrooms, living someplace new. Wish you were here. I sprinkle sandalwood dust on the ribbon for my first 5K the token for my first solo trip. Milestones so small and unremarkable, only you could understand and be proud. Remember world history class, how I translated lectures to you each night, partly to practice, partly to keep you with me. Every day, there's so much new I want to show you like the spongy tang of injera, pork belly banh mi melting like butter on the tongue. All these places I have traveled without you so I can forget how without you I am. Remember when I was 10 and hateful, trying too hard to be cool. How in a rare moment you said all you wanted was for me to love my life, my only life, this life you started. Here, look how the clouds blush so fiercely, the stark blue winter, so cold and bright. And I will end there. Thank you everyone. And once again, please support Susan's book below. Thank you all so much for being here. And wow, thank you, Roy and Jenny, um, for reading first. It was so wonderful to hear you read. Um, if you all don't have their books yet, um, please support them. They're both beautiful. Roy's came out last year, um, and Jenny's officially comes out later, um, I think in October, I believe it is. Um, so I feel like a level of solidarity there as poets, but also poets during the, the pandemic. Um, and thank you for Women and Children First for believing in this event and in my book. Um, and thank you all for just being in the chat and showing us some of your energy. Um, I'm gonna read a few poems from the collection. Um, and Dear Diaspora um, was really my attempt to better understand what it means to be you know, Vietnamese, a member of the Vietnamese diaspora, um, and some of the history and context of just how um, my family, how I arrived here. 
Um, I spent a lot of my life just pushing that part of my identity away. And um, at some point, the cognitive dissonance of, you know, having this huge empty hole um, when it came to my identity caught up to me. And luckily, I had um, found poetry and writing, and that's kind of what, what helped me. And um, of course, it's still a, a learning process. Um, so this collection follows um, a character, um, Susie, Susie with an I. Um, so you're going to hear some third person poems um, kind of talking about Susie growing up in America, adolescence, and then some first person poems, um, you know, where Susie is speaking in perhaps a, an older, more reflective voice that is able to address the diaspora directly um, and ask some, some different questions. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem um, called what Susie believes. What Susie believes. Eating too much ketchup might turn you pink. Some library books have pages made from recycled toilet paper. Both hands are needed on the steering wheel. The yellow tape measure she finds from her mother's tailoring days is a Burmese python she drapes across her shoulders, a la Britney Spears. The more she thinks about her mother or father dying, the more likely it will happen. God can hear her thinking of sex during Sunday mass, but not when she prays for her parents' safety at home on the way to and from work. The century egg her mother gifts her cannot spoil. The sparrows that fly into H Mart perched on rafters cannot leave. Worse than dying is disappearing. The last time she saw him was after dinner washing the dishes. Her mother had brought home rice from a chili soup and patty crabs. This wasn't her father's first disappearance. Sometimes Susie couldn't tell when he disappeared from when he left for fishing trips on the coast, when he stayed out all night and went to work after sleeping in the car or no sleep at all. But always he materialized in a few days or a week from the broken down cardboard boxes and crushed pistachios in his car, one dollar scratch offs and green green grass emerged her father, dark and sinewy, mouth full of resin. Susie with an eye is not afraid of the dark or the things that move in its current. She approaches school like she approaches most things, eyes narrowed, scanning the edges of sight. When she scribbles her name, she dots the eye, rubs the sharp graphite onto her finger. Before bed, she says, our father, our father, our father, our father, as fast as she can. The fastest was in Sunday school. Highlighting the Virgin Mary pink, she drowned out the counselor's groan with prayer. Tonight, she turns her blinds inward. Through a tiny sliver, the moon spoils the dark. Uh, and the title, um, Dear Diaspora, I took from a series of poems that appear throughout the collection called Letter to the Diaspora, and the first line um, is Dear Diaspora. Um, these poems began as um, a longer serial poem, and then after some time and um, some work with some mentors, um, I ended up splitting them up um, and just working on them as individual pieces. And Dear Diaspora started out as a placeholder title because I couldn't think of anything else, um, and then I kept referring it to the collection of diaspora and it just, it, one, it stuck and it, it just made sense. Letter to the diaspora. Uh, and this is the first one that appears in my collection. Dear diaspora, I believe in the American dream strike through. Last night I had the American dream. In the dream, I had an indoor pool. In the dream, I walked my dead dog with a diamond leash. I ate a greasy burger with my perfect hands. I had the most beautiful sex. My skin was smooth, alabaster as the moon. In the morning, everything had changed. There was no pool, only twine for drying clothes. The dead remained dead. My perfect hands held nothing. Nothing was better. If I say my body is grieving, after Athena Faraxad. If I say my body is grieving, is it American or Vietnamese? My mother said, our country no longer exists. 
my father said, in our language, the same word means green and blue, sun. My father said, to distinguish between the two, you say sun la, green leaf, and sun zajai, blue sky. My mother's miscarriage after me said, what color was I? My mother said, in our language, the same word means land and water, nook. My grandmother said, all of language is a metaphor. Say what you mean. My father said, if I say cannot live without nook, do I mean country? My mother said, Vietnam's body curves like the letter S, serpentine, fragile. My father said, the Mekong Delta translates to river of nine dragons because nine tributaries sprawl towards the sea. My mother's miscarriage after me said, was my salted mouth American or Vietnamese? My mother said, don't translate me. My grandmother said, don't speak lest your tongue rush like a river. In the night, history absconds with us. We learn to open in darkness. My mother said, when you tell it, do I float on land and water? My father said, am I the green leaf, the blue sky? My American mouth cannot separate itself from my body. Um, so in the middle of my collection, I have um, a longer um, poem called The Boat People. Um, that kind of gives some context and pulls history in terms of the Vietnam War and really post Vietnam War. Um, so I'm just gonna pull, I'm just gonna jump around in this, um, in this section. The boat people. She Googles FOB after someone calls her fresh off the boat. She's never been on a boat. What she finds, blank deaths from blank to blank, blank memorials in blank countries. On open water, they traveled on small fishing junks, origami boats, arms and legs folded, one over the other. Trawlers smuggling thousands of bodies, searching for international water, living on empty for weeks and months, looking for coastline that did not push back. Interview number one. The former boat person stated that as many as 20 ships passed by without stopping and coming to their aid, ignoring their cries for help. When they finally saw shore, the refugees sank the boat with their bodies, pounding their hands and feet so that they could not be towed away. The people smugglers speak. They come to us with black market gold, whole life savings, homes sold, they, the soon to be defectors. They will say they're going on holiday or nothing at all. They will disappear in the middle of the night, walk through mud and green jungle, reappear in darkest morning. Some commission their own boats built, traveling petri dish of human waste fever dream. We know men who have tried to leave many times only to be turned back, bad weather, bad feeling. They will not give up they would squander their life savings a dozen times. Anything for the chance of freedom, the promise of blue ocean. Can you define a refugee? A refugee seeks refuge. Interview number six. I did not want to go back when they took us to the plane. It was over very quick. We owned almost nothing still. After seven years, the men brought their fists together, desperate. We dragged our feet, refused to walk through our bodies against their barricade. We're met with water, cannon. The men were rolled into blankets, loaded into the cabin like a cigarette in the plane's mouth, a stilled bullet. Um, I'm just checking my timer. I'm gonna read one more poem um, to end things with. Okay, I just changed my mind. Um, I'm gonna read the very last poem in my collection. Unending. I am learning how to hold grief in my mouth, something alive until it isn't, like a field is a field until it isn't, until it is just the color green. Listen when I tell you how a field folds into a clover when I'm on my hands, how the memory of what I'm looking for 
is not as important as the ground it claims. I don't mean that grief can be unalive or that I keep it loaded in that place between lower lip and teeth. I mean, I never walked the land where my father harvested seeds. In his field, he waited for green to bend into gold, a single blade splitting light until there was nothing else. My father remembers, I watch my shadow. Thank you. Um, I think we have some time for, um, sorry, I'm just catching up with all your nice comments. Um, I think we have some time for a conversation between uh, me, Jenny, and Roy. And then if there are any questions from the audience, um, please feel free to post those and I can um, call those out as well. Um, yeah, so I'd like to start us off with some questions. Um, it has been a tough couple of years. So I am just wondering how have you guys been taking care of yourselves and what is something that has brought you joy? Oof, yeah, it has been some tough times. <laughs> um, I can jump in on this one first, I guess. Um, I think, I to be honest, I haven't been writing very much the past year and a half. Um, I think I've been turning to art and creating things, but not necessarily with language in the way I might have before the past year and a half. Um, I think sometimes now, you know, when I have deadlines or projects or when I just want to process something, um, I want to make something with my hand, something tangible in a way. And it's wonderful to have a book that's out in the world that's tangible. But um, honestly, I've been making a lot of zines and a lot of visual, visual art. I know I made companion zines for the book that some of you may have gotten. Um, and I, I had another project that um, where someone asked me like, hey, what are your writing rituals? You know, write something up and it felt more right to make something like a, an actual zine that I could fold open into a room instead of trying to describe it because I don't know, um, sometimes language is enough and sometimes it isn't. And right now I've been turning to, to other, I think, um, forms of art in terms of what I'm making. Um, and I'm still turning to language in terms of reading it, but I don't have the bandwidth right now to, to write too much. Um, but I think still making something um, physical that I can gift or give as an offering um, has brought me a lot of joy just because I think it's kind of my, my love language is not necessarily getting gifts, but I like to give. Um, so that's been bringing me a lot of joy just to, to give something to, to other people. Yeah, I agree with you, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, there's, it's, it's, it's weird what grief does, right? Um, especially to one's like, um, artwork, um, what one, you know, where one gravitates. Um, and I had mentioned at the beginning of my reading that, um, the thing with the cello and, um, sort of the idea of traveling, you know, down new paths like i think it's been sort of like my theme this you know during this pandemic because since this, this pandemic in itself is something i've never experienced before i feel like i have to experience new things too along with that so i actually learned how to swim um and it, yeah during this pandemic and it was it was bizarre because again i was thinking like as an adult what are you doing roy you know, with with the cello as an adult, what are you doing, Roy? And and I think that I've had to suspend so much of that, right? Like um, this sort of expectation that to be good at something, you need to have started that when you know when you were like a fetus. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think you know, along with that, um, I've been eating a lot. I've been trying out different like styles, different you know cuisines. Um, and, and it's been, again, it's been, it's been, I've been grateful that that's, um, that I can enjoy something at home that I can enjoy that someone else, you know, something that someone else made, um, especially, um, given the fact that I just, I need connection, right. I've needed connection during this pandemic. What about you, Jenny? Um, I was 
I love what you said, Roy, about like doing new things and starting to learn how to swim. I also don't know how to swim and that is kind of inspirational. But yeah. similarly, I have started like doing gymnastics, which I never did. I'm terrified of heights. I'm terrified of inversions. Uh, and like, I'm terrible at it. And it's great to be terrible at something. Like I, it feels so liberating and ref not refreshing, I'm terrible at many things, liberating, let's just say, to like just start completely over um, as an adult and like have no expectations for myself because like I've just never done this and I don't expect to be good at it. And like, and it's also nice when things feel so stagnant to like, I don't know, go in. So I've been starting to go into this gym because um, things are pretty, pretty low in San Francisco. Um, and like, it's nice to go in and each time it's like, I still can't really do this, but like, I can maybe hold a handstand for like another second or two, or I can do like one more push up, And that just feels like progress when it feels like progress is so hard to come by these days. It's humbling. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Y'all are inspiring me because y'all reminded me that earlier this year, I bought a pair of roller skates and I was terrible, but then, you know, it got hot in Arizona, which it did because it gets really hot here. And I was like, now I can't do it, but also I was not good at it. Um, like I remember at one point I was on campus trying to practice um, and like I fell and a bunch of students walked by and they probably didn't even see it, but I was like, oh, okay, um, I'm done for the day. Um, but now that it gets cooler in Arizona, I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like I need to get back into it. And, feel okay with failing and looking like a fool, honestly. Um, which sometimes I forget, especially in writing, because like, well, I can write, I've written good stuff, but when you come back to the page, it's still a bunch of crap for a long time and then eventually <laughs> you have something, to be honest. Um, so this is a good reminder. And if you see me again in the future when it's cooler here, like feel free to hold me accountable because <laughs> I just forgot. And I was like, yep, I, I did that. And now I need to like get back into that. Um, but it's inspiring just to hear that y'all are like, trying new things, um, especially right now. And like, whether it's directly related to writing or not, right. And having that contribute to your life and to joy and all the things that need to be happening too. Um, yeah. I think it's so interesting what you, how you made that connection to writing where it's like, there are days, right. When you go into, you know, to the, to that blank page and you're just like, I know what this thing wants. Then you know, I know what this space wants. And then you go there sometimes, and you're just like, I've never written anything. W like, what <laughs> am I? Right? Like, I've published stuff. Like, I don't think so. Um, so I think that that idea of starting anew can be um, it can be daunting, right? And I think that as writers, we deal with that sort of dauntingness, you know. Um, often <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and that actually I, I wanted to ask you all um just what it's been like to to have a book come out during the pandemic because your, yours came out last year roy mine came out earlier this month jenny yours co is coming out soon but i mean that in and of itself is an experience um and yeah it's been wild at least on my end and i'm kind of curious like how how y'all have been handling it um that's a very big question but however y'all wanna i guess spin that yeah i think you know i'll start because of you know <laughs> mine came out last year um it came out you know in may and <laughs> i was like well i'm like i don't know if we're all gonna just die you know and here's this book and and you know i'm just <laughs> This this world is gonna end up being something like what you see in Wally, -E, the movie. Um, you know, I mean, it might just end up being that way. But um, I felt I felt terrified, and I think, you know, I still deal with a sense of grief with um, the book coming out in the pandemic because, um, you know, in terms of in terms of in person events, I think I've only done one. Um, for the book and 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 that's it you know and i think um most of it of yeah all of it has been online i'm very grateful for uh teachers um teachers bringing the book to classrooms because that's where i've met so many new people voices like um you know that's where the spark begins um but you know 
I've had, you know, my, my publisher, um, it, they've been so good at like, hey, you know, uh, let's check in, you know, how are you doing? And, and beyond the book, you know, how are you doing, um, you know, in terms of like life, you know, how is your PhD going? Um, how are your parents? My parents um, were here during that in that that mm-hmm. one in person reading I did um, this year, and they got to meet my my editors, and it was just so interesting, right? Like this book had been out in the world for a year or more than a year, and then to see that happen. So I think that there's grief attached to it um, for me. I think that. And I think that it often happens because, you know, I'm I'm reminded that we only have one chance, right? To have one, the first book. And then I think for, especially um, writers of color, um, it's, there's so much that goes into that first book, right? Um, I've heard things like, people say things like, oh, you know, don't include everything on your first po- book, you know, you're gonna have other books and this and that. And I'm just like, first of all, I am queer, I am brown, you know, like the world is constantly trying to kill me. So Mm -hmm. if I try to do everything in this one book, you know, so be it, don't worry, I'll have other stuff that I'll come up with. But yeah, it's been, it's been challenging, but it's readings like these that, um, that remind me, oh, you're a poet, Roy, you're a writer, people need you to be in conversation. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. I definitely relate to that, Roy. Um, I mean, my book isn't quite out yet, though it, it kind of feels like it is just because pre-orders started going out early, like in July, because of the pandemic. <laughs> and I know this happened to you too, Susan. Um, but I think I like sort of deluded myself because there was that period in the summer where like it seemed like things were getting a little bit better. And I was like, oh, maybe I can have an in-person launch. And I, I don't know, it, it has made planning events and such difficult because I don't really, I didn't really know what to expect. And I was just hoping, even though I knew it was sort of unrealistic, I just, I really wanted to get a sheet cake from Costco with my book on it. And now I probably won't because there won't be enough people to eat it and I'm not eating all of that. Um, Save it over time. <laughs> And like, that is just an emblem of my grief over this book mm-hmm. is not getting this cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Jenny, I will get you this cake. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna Venmo you after this event. <laughs> um, yeah, I relate to everything you all said. Um, it's been interesting times. I mean, in a way I'm grateful because all these virtual events means I can read with writers who maybe I wouldn't be able to read with and at venues maybe I wouldn't, you know, and the accessibility. Um, people commenting it about the cake. <laughs> um, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm um, but yeah, so in a way I, I'm grateful, but you're right, Roy. Like I'm always like, there's just, this is like the one first book I'll ever have, you know? So I've been devoting a lot of time and energy and bandwidth to a lot of the planning and behind the scenes, you know? Um, on top of, you know, but we all have other stuff we're doing too, of course. So it's been, it's definitely been tough. And I don't know about y'all, but in doing these readings, I'm reminded, like I wrote some of this a while ago. Um, so it's been interesting, like you said, where to like put that hat back on and be a poet and have these conversations, especially cause I wrote it a while ago and at a time when I had more time for writing and reading and like more conversations about poetry and literature, which I'm not having right now, like in my day to day so much. So um, sometimes people are like, oh, like, Here's a question. I'm like, that's a very smart question. Um, I don't know, you know, like past me wrote this awesome and present me is trying to get back into that, that mind space. Um, I think, and just because I'm not quite there and part of it, of course, is, is the pandemic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said earlier, I feel a level of solidarity just in terms of, um, the book coming out during, during this time and, um, trying to support all those writers and like promote all those writers and stuff too. Um, yeah, definitely and, feeling the solidarity. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if other people have questions in the Q&A. If you do, y'all feel free to throw it in. Otherwise, we can definitely keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I guess while, you're, of us. 
I guess while we wait for questions to pop mm -hmm. up, I'm curious, like, how old is the oldest poem in each of your collections? Like, how long ago did you write it? Ah. Ooh, I think. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I feel, that's a great question. Um, I feel like, you know, some of these poems have been, you know, have appeared on different files and different names, different sort of versions, this and that. Um, but I think that the oldest poem might be from 2000, ooh, 2012, 2013. Um, and it's what I call a gift poem. It just sort of came and I didn't really have to do much revision to it. Um, that's not the case for most of the poems where I have had like more than 50 <laughs> versions of them. <laughs> yeah, I think the oldest poem is like 2013. And I don't know that I'm ever gonna feel comfortable saying which one it is because I don't wanna be judged that way, but just knowing that myself um yeah it's it's like yeah that's my little secret <laughs> i love this question jenny i i don't think i've ever been asked this or asked this question before or like encountered it um because now i'm just like wait when did i do this um i mean i think i'm gonna guess because there are a few poems that i wrote in the beginning of my mfa like a few things survived that first year because i'm i'm like roy i wrote all these poems i could not tell you where they are located and I have no like <laughs> consistent process for like labeling them like you think the same poem different drafts it'd be consistent I don't know guys maybe this is what they should teach us in the MFA, uh, but maybe not um so I think some survived from my first year that got you know a little bit of some some edits but um so I think that'd be like 2015 because that's when I started my MFA program um and I think it's because my third year I started the beginning of my third year of the MFA and I was like, oh, I have to turn in a thesis and like, what is it going to be? Let me start this whole project. Um, and that's where a lot of these Susie poems came from. And then I realized I'm writing a lot about the same thing, right? It's me trying to understand the diaspora and some of these other poems I've written earlier on actually belong in the same manuscript. And um, it was like a mentor that helped me kind of see the connections and the dots there, you know, because I kind of felt like, oh, like this has to be a, a collection of just third person poems because I started this project, but then I was like, I don't know if I can sustain this for a whole manuscript. And if I can't or don't want to as a writer, people don't want to read that whole thing. But um, so yeah, I'd say 2015. And then um, I don't remember the latest, I'll have to think about like the, the latest poem too. I think the last mm -hmm. poem I wrote for this collection actually is the last poem like in the collection in terms of where I placed it. Okay. Well, for you, Jenny. Um, thank you for humoring me and answering this question. <laughs> I think my oldest poem in the collection is from 2010, actually. Um, I, I don't know how many people know this, but I, I actually didn't get an MFA. So I got my PhD in cancer biology. So I had this very long period of like not really uh, doing writing stuff all that seriously, though I did write most of the poems during that time. Um, and one of the poems in this collection I wrote in my like college creative writing class uh, at Vanderbilt. And I also won't share which one that is. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of shocked that it made it in, to be honest. Um, yeah, takes a long time. I think um, we have a question, right? Yes, I just noticed yes. that too. Okay. Can you discuss the influence of the quote unquote American dream on your ideas of success, of being good at, um, et cetera, on your poetry and your creative process? Hmm. That's a really good question. Yeah. I can, I can start. I can you, want, you, want me to, you want me to start, Susan? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually, I actually like this question um, because basically, I think for me that this question gets at 
not just questions of identity and, and, and but also like what is allegiance right and like how do we see ourselves also through um through the lens of a country right citizenship things like that and i actually i literally have a poem called the american dream in my my manuscript and um what's interesting for me about why i called it the american dream and i was thinking about um i think susan brought up the american dream in, in one of her poems is um like taking this the, taking this concept you know to to task right um mm -hmm. i think for me i i had to in the book but also in the work that I, i'm actually working on um on a young adult uh, memoir in verse at the moment and um and it's an expansion of this question um, that Maritza, Maritza asked about the American dream. And um, the idea that the American dream is, it almost feels like like this shadow, right? This shadow that just follows you everywhere. Um, and, it, and it shows up, you know, through standardized tests. It shows up through, um, as Maritza pointed out, like the good immigrant, like the model immigrant um, aspect. I think for me, coming from Honduras, I was not part of the model immigrant um, um, it sort of stereotype. Instead, I was part of the, the stereotype that, you know, um, people like me, families like mine, we, we, we are at the bottom of, the, of, of, of basically anything. So we're the ones who have to do the agricultural work. We have to do the, the you know, we have to be mates. We have to be um, um, repair people. So um, this very much, and, and, and I responded so like uh, fervently to um, when Jenny brought up like the, um, the the bridge in San Francisco, right? And like the, the blood, right? the, the, the of, of our ancestors, right? Um, the American dream is something that when it comes up, it has to be contested. At least for me, it has to be questioned. It has to be um, dismantled, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I love that, Roy. Thank you for answering that first. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I will take a stab at this next. Um, I think I am very much like what is supposed to be the model minority, I guess, as a Chinese American. Um, and that has largely influenced like like how I was taken away from poetry, I guess. I pursued STEM, obviously I was interested enough to get a PhD, but like a large part of that was also like, oh, I have to do this because I'm Asian. And like, I also grew up as one of, as the only like Chinese American person um, in, that, in that community. And I didn't really have anything to compare myself to. And I think like that was also true for writing. Like at that time, I didn't, I wasn't seeing Asian American poets. Now there are, there, it feels like there are suddenly so many um, or just that so many that I'm aware of um, and in community with. Um, but back then it was like, oh, I guess this is my path. I have to go to medical school. I have to like do something that is vaguely related to that. And it is, even though I'm, no longer like exclusively on that path anymore. It is hard to get out of that sort of like productivity mindset, this idea that you are worth your output. And I can intellectually objectively know that's not true, um, but it's hard not to feel that way. Um, and I think maybe that is compounded by being people of color where like, you know, we are worth exactly like what we can contribute to society. Um, I just wanted to read a quote from Ocean Bone real quick, who 
I have to pull it up because I always butcher the quote, but I feel like it says everything I, I want to say because um, I definitely grew up always reading and wanting to be a writer, um, although I never thought it'd be poetry because that's not what I was reading when I was younger. Um, and I remember my, my family and parents growing up and like my family, I come from a family of immigrants and refugees. They'd be like, what do you want to be? And I'd be like, I want to be a writer. And they'd be like, oh, okay, that's cool. But like, don't you want to be, you know, like all these other things? And I'd be like, no, you know, I'm like young. And they're like, okay, she'll probably grow out of it, right? Yeah. And I definitely spent first two years of college, like undecided and bouncing around from different majors, but none of them were English. And then like by junior year, I was like, fuck it, I'm going to be an English major because nothing else is like doing what like those classes were doing for me at the time um which is interesting because even in those classes it's not like i was reading about the vietnamese experience or like people of color's experience in general like not really but at the same time i don't know it was doing something for me to want to explore myself in the future in, in language and i don't think i knew it at the time though um and i just wanted to read this quote because i feel like it's so i don't know it kind of says everything i'm thinking um, and the quote goes, the first generation made it here and to live at all is a privilege. The second generation, the great conundrum there, the paradox is that they want to be seen and they want to make something. What better way to make something that will give yourself agency than to be an artist. So many of us immigrant children end up betraying our parents to achieve our parents' dream. Um, which I think we don't need to dissect all that right here, right now. Um, but I feel like that, that says a lot of, um, a lot of what, what I'm thinking in terms of the American dream in the sense of like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think this is what my parents would describe as success. You know, it's not what I, at least not what I grew up believing. Um, I think I had to let some of that go because, and, and, and right, because that's um, what I need to do. But at the same time, I know it was probably, um, at least for me as a, a writer of color, like at the same time, it's still, but how do I make money? How do I pay rent? How do I eat and take care of the community at the same time? Um, so it's definitely some tension, tension there between follow your dream of writing, but also, you know, how do you make a living and support yourself and, and family too? Um, so, yeah. I think that it relates to that word behind you, Susan, decolonize, like basically decolonize like expectations, our imaginations. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that question, Rita. That was a great question. Um, I guess related to that question, do, wait, do we still have time? Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, something related to that question, as I was like reading through both of your books, um, what I was thinking about is that something we all have in common is that we're we're all like bi or multilingual and we're all immigrants or children of immigrants and i'm curious about like how that influences um just like the way you think about like and use language um i think so you know, I grew up speaking Vietnamese, but like not having very like um, strong Vietnamese language skills, to be honest. Like, I think I really quickly assimilated in US education system and like, you know, very quickly um, grew more in, in terms of English, you know. Um, so like, I can have conversations out family, but it's very conversational. Like I can't, I wouldn't be able to comfortably talk about like politics or just, I don't know, things that I could easily do in English, right? I just don't have the language yet. Um, and in grad school, I actually spent three years taking like um, Vietnamese language courses. They were undergrad co courses, but it was a good starting point. And at first I was like, yeah, I know how to say some of this. And then very quickly I was like, I do not know this language. And I definitely didn't know how to read or write before I took those classes. And unfortunately it's been a few years, so I'm very out of practice in terms of reading and writing. Um, so I'd probably have to get back into that if anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, it opened up a lot of doors just like in terms of um, my imagination, as well as playing with language. Um, sometimes I forget that too, that with poetry and language, I can do that. Like I can play with language. Um, it took me a while to figure that out too in poetry. And in, even in this manuscript that um, I can write the truth, but also it's a version of the truth, right? Because there's room for imagination and fiction, which definitely exists in the collection. Um, and I actually think 
I don't know, for me, there's some tension in, you know, English being a home in some sense, but at the same time, not. Um, whereas Vietnamese, in terms of language, is a home, but it's also not because I don't know it that well. Um, and that actually makes me feel very distant um, at the same time. So I think a lot of my poems, probably some in the collection, um, definitely some of the stuff I like I wrote after the collection have been kind of questioning like language and absence of language and um, having a language. Um, I feel like the word language comes up a lot <laughs> um, and, and in the poetry, um, especially after this collection too, um, to a point where I'm like, okay, you need to figure out a different word maybe. Um, but I'm definitely grappling a lot with that um, in, in, in my work still. I was gonna add to um, what you just said, Susan, um, that line that you had, I think that don't translate me, which was so poignant for me, like hearing that, right? I can imagine like spirits, right? In, in my life, like saying that to me, like don't translate me. Um, and at the same time, you know, I also feel like the, the, the contradiction we live in, right? Is this whole, is the fact that we're always it, in living in translation, right? Because since we use language, we're always in that space of translation. But something that I really like that um, about Jenny's work is, um, and I was thinking about that with this question of language and translation is um, our rituals, like rituals come up in your in your work, well, in, in both of you, uh, your work. And I was thinking about that too, right? Um, like, what are some rituals that um, that I do that I would never feel comfortable perhaps, or the opportunity has never come up that I need to share them or that I might share them with other people. And I was thinking about that whole fiasco that happened, um, I think not that long ago where, um, I don't know if it was Ulta or Sephora, was <laughs> um, one of these stores, stores was trying to sell like a kit that basically that kit was like, if you were into witchcraft, like if you perform the rituals and you got the mm -hmm. incense and you got all of these different oils and blah, 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 that somehow like that meant that you're a witch, right? And I was thinking about like the ways in which like capitalism like cheapens every single thing that's so personal, right? Um, our language, um, even the conversations that you've said, Susan, that you have with your family that are not even political, but they're just about like, you know, everyday things. Like there's something about capitalism wanting to take that, put that on the frame and say, you know what? Your experience is the same as everybody's right? When in fact, that's not the case. Um, so I, I think about that in, in my work, right? When I use Spanish, when I resort to Spanglish, um, what is it that I'm trying to keep local? And what is it that I'm trying to um, have the reader understand that I'm thinking about in a more global sense? And, you know, even with, with your book, Susan, when you're talking about diaspora, it's like, that's such a term, right? That can be easily applied like or often applied to so many different situations to the but the, the problem with that is like how that individuality right of the vietnamese diaspora gets lost right in something in in, in, in universalizing that so i i think that in my book i'm i'm constantly or in my work there's this like push and pull when it comes to like translation, but also like, you know, translating of culture, translating of values, translating of like even idioms um, or or even one of my parents speaking or one of my aunts speaking, right? Or my aunt speaking, like there's something so sacred about that, that in translating, it's almost like the sacredness has just vanished. Yeah, that's what I wanted to add to what you said, Susan. You're just coming up with these questions, Jenny, like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so good. I, well, I loved your answer, Roy. And I, I definitely have noticed that in your work that you do like weave in and out of Spanish in a way that 
is so fluid and does not cheapen anything. And, and I think there are definitely situations where like I read something and I feel like kind of weird about it when, yeah, yeah when it is translated. And I, th I think you've really hit the nail on the head with why that is. And I could never quite pinpoint that. Mm -hmm. I remember, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> no, you know, and this is not like, you know, we all read all kinds of things out there and and I'm sure that some of us cringe, some of us, you know, find things, you know, um, debatable. But um, one of the things that I remember reading, there was a, uh, it was, it was a poem and the poem was talking about like, um, like the, like sort of like the, the underworld of queer culture, right? And like hooking up and, and, and talking about cruising and, and whatnot. And the poem does something that for me was, it, it, it rang false. And what it was is that the poem discloses specifically the location of where this is taking place, like, like in this particular city. And I was just like, there's something honest in saying this and sharing this, right? But then there's also something that feels almost like like selling out, right? Like mm -hmm. you suddenly gave away the coordinates of our hookup place, right? Mm -hmm. Our one of our sanctuaries, right? One of like our comfort places. Like, and so that I constantly think about that, right? Like, do I wanna share the coordinates of where this is happening? Or do I wanna keep those to myself and just say, there's something nebulous there, right? Um, I can give you this much, but 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 after that, um, I'm not willing to go past that. Mm -hmm. Susan, you were gonna say something though. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, I remember now, I was like, wait a minute. I left my brain. Um, I was just going to say, like, yeah, I, to be honest and also vulnerable, like, there were some poems I wrote early on in the MFA where, like, family members were, like, speaking broken English and, like, all these things, because I think I was trying to write towards, like, a caricature, and I don't know why, and I think probably it was because I was encountering some of that poetry um, for the first time, too, because it made me realize in grad school, I was like, I've never read a Vietnamese American poet before grad school. <coughs> Excuse me have I really even read that many Asian American poets, right? Um, and I took a lot of classes outside the MFA to, to get a wider like literature, honestly, especially AAPI voices, um, excuse me. But yeah, I was writing like towards a caricature and then I was like, wait a minute, like, do I even know people? Do they actually speak like this? Um, how would I feel if I were to read this poem? Like, does it feel authentic or am I honestly trying to like fake it or like do it because I feel like this is like what it needs to be. Um, and, you know, and there's lots to unpack there that I won't go into right now, but this conversation is just reminding me of that because I was like, oh, this is what it, it needs to be. And then I was like, no, it doesn't. Um, I'm writing towards something that for me isn't, at least not for me, like isn't a truth. Um, so yeah, so again, Jenny, thank you for these questions. <laughs> yeah, of course, thank you guys for answering them. Thank you all so much for your readings and for this conversation. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please get all of these incredible poets books. Um, please get Dear, Dear Diaspora, please pre-order Jenny's book um, and please pick up Roy's book, which came out last year. <laughs> yes, all of them in the screen there with Susan. Um, I can put up mine also. Oh, yes. There. Here. So please, you there also go. want to have all three of these books um, on your shelves. And thank you all so much for joining us. This has been wonderful. Um, a great reminder of why I love poetry so much. Um, and why it's such an integral part of my life as well. Um, so thank you all for, for being here. Bye everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.